This video is going to discuss something that, to my knowledge, hasn't really been talked about. A hidden gold-rich river that has been covered by sediment by the recent iteration of the Murray River and has, as a result, never been found. In fact, attempts to find a river might have never even occurred, as the geological knowledge that we have today simply wasn't available to the miners in the late 19th century. When prospectors arrived in Victoria, as you can see by this map, they mined extremely gold-saturated deep leads, which I will define in a moment, all the way up to the Murray River in various areas where they then stopped their mining activity once reaching the Murray. This is for a good reason. When they sampled the gravels of the Murray, they likely found little to no gold. What they didn't realise back then was that the Murray, in its current form, is much younger than they realised. For those unfamiliar with the term, a deep lead, also known as a Paleo River, is the name used to describe ancient buried river systems that were once active watercourses. Over time, these channels became covered by layers of sediment or volcanic material, sealing away rich deposits of alluvial gold. These leads are found in areas where rivers flowed millions of years ago, carrying gold and other heavy minerals downstream from gold-bearing highlands. The gold would settle into these channels and become concentrated over time, and when the river changed course, or was buried, the gold and everything else in the river, like gemstones, were locked into place, creating deep leads that miners targeted for their rich and valuable deposits. The river that we will look at in this video was buried by sediment instead of volcanic activity, and we'll be using a new tool to highlight its flow patterns, radiometric scans. I will define why we are using this tool, how you can use it, and how to understand it in the latter parts of this video. I have three videos planned for this series. This video will focus on the deep leads of the Compaspe River, where mining activities ceased at Echuca. In preceding episodes, we will look at the deep leads that followed the Golban and the leads that followed the Loddon. If you enjoy this type of content, please do me a solid and click the like button, and consider subscribing to the channel so that you don't miss the other two videos I have planned. It's necessary to separate them, as each lead has its own unique thing going on that needs to be the focus of its own video to clarify it. Firstly, you might notice that something interesting is happening on the map here. Rather than the specific green lines that you see in most places, which follow the ancient river's course exactly, it is broadened out along these areas. This expansion suggests that the ancient river channels were not confined to a single narrow path, but instead spread out into a network of braided channels and alluvial fans. These features are characteristic of rivers that meandered across floodplains, depositing gold-bearing sediments over a wide area. Over time, as the river shifted its course, it left behind a spread of deposits rather than a concentrated line, which now appear as the broad zones we see on the map. As you can see, miners followed deep leads from Bendigo up to Echuca. Bendigo is the richest gold field ever discovered in Victoria, and one of the richest in the world. So you can imagine that chasing these deep leads were well worth it for the miners. They faced some issues though, that I will discuss shortly. These deep leads were a bit different to the deep leads that followed exact river courses. As you can see, the deep lead lines run directly adjacent to the modern streams. These leads can be buried by a significant amount of sediment, with shafts constructed that may reach depths of between 20 to 70 metres, or approximately 66 to 230 feet below the surface, or even deeper. Mining through sedimentary deposits is generally more hazardous than mining through volcanic rock like basalt. Sedimentary layers are less stable and prone to shifting, which increases the risk of tunnel collapses, and they often carry higher water tables, leading to frequent flooding risks. The composition of sediment can vary greatly over short distances, making it unpredictable. Extensive support structures are required to attempt to prevent accidents, though attempt is the key word, as accidents still occurred even with these structures in place. Volcanic rock, while hard of the breakthrough, is more solid and stable, making it safer overall for deep lead mining. One can only imagine the anxiety that miners used to feel during deep lead mining, knowing that at any moment, something like a collapse could occur and end their existence. If anxiety is something you suffer from, then I might have a solution. This video is a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Today I want to briefly talk about the importance of mental health and how therapy can make a difference. For those who haven't tried therapy, it might feel intimidating or unnecessary, but therapy is actually an incredible resource. It offers a safe space where you can openly share what's on your mind, whether that's stress, anxiety about digging a deep lead shaft, sadness, worries or relationship issues without fear of judgement. BetterHelp's therapists are trained mental health professionals who are there to listen and help you see things from new perspectives. 
They can provide insights and teach you techniques for managing emotions, reducing stress and making positive changes in your life. Seeking therapy is a sign of strength and self-awareness. It takes courage to acknowledge when you need help. That's why I'm thrilled to partner with BetterHelp, an online therapy platform that makes it easy to get started. BetterHelp connects you with a network that features a multitude of trained therapists. You simply fill out a questionnaire and, on average, you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. BetterHelp offers flexibility too. If your first therapist isn't right, you can switch to another until you find someone you really connect with with no additional charge. If you're struggling and think you'd benefit from a therapy session, click the link in the description or go to our paid partner directly at betterhelp.com forward slash osgeology and get 10% off your first month of therapy. Therapy can be a transformative experience and BetterHelp is the best place to start this important journey. Now, there's a good reason that these operations all stop the moment they reach the Murray. One of them is the fact that the Murray in its current form has only been flowing for the past 25,000 years or so. Whilst the Murray would undoubtedly contain gold, it's likely to be fine gold in very limited amounts. In my last video, we dove into the history of the Murray up to the 65,000 year mark. It's definitely worth watching that for an in-depth dive into the Murray River's recent history, and I'll include a link to the video in the description. In its previous iteration, when it flowed through an area known as Green Gully in New South Wales, what wasn't discussed in that video is the fact that the Murray River is much, much older than 65,000 years. Its formation can be traced to the emergence of the Great Dividing Range, which occurred between 90 to 100 million years ago. This range spans from Victoria up to Queensland. As the Great Dividing Range rose, it created a major watershed that directed rivers flowing from the highlands either eastward toward the Pacific Ocean or westward into what is now the Murray-Darling Basin. This watershed provided the topographical divide that ultimately allowed the Murray River to develop as a westward flowing system fed by rainfall and snowmelt from the Australian Alps and other highland areas along the range. So before the Murray River took its present course, it lay further north, receiving waters from tributaries like the Campaspe that flow directly through Victoria's goldfields into New South Wales. This is where the video gets to its most interesting point. These leads that stopped at the present day Murray River would have continued past it to at least the Green Gully Point. This means that these lines, these gold rich rivers, are longer than what was mined. When miners were working on these leads, they most likely got confused when they reached the Murray and realised it was very low in terms of its gold content, so they stopped. What they didn't realise is that ancient sections of this gold bearing river, carried by the Campaspe, continued flowing past the point of the Murray, and it did so only 45,000 years ago. Now here is where we discuss the stacked river systems that exist here, which makes this whole topic even more compelling. The deep lead mining likely occurred in the Shepparton Formation, which typically ranges from about 50 to 125 metres, or 164 to 410 feet in depth. But beneath this formation we have two additional alluvial layers. The Calaville Formation, which lies beneath the Shepparton Formation and is usually found at depths of around 100 to 200 metres, or 328 to 656 feet. It consists of well-sorted sands and gravels. Beneath this is the Renmark Group, which extends beyond a 200 metre or 656 foot depth. Each of these layers would have deep leads associated with them. So we have a stacked system of paleo channels or deep leads at varying depths, each associated with different periods of fluvial activity. It's certain that miners never reached the Calaville Formation, let alone the Renmark Group due to the complexity of digging through pure sedimentary layers, which, as mentioned before, are often unstable and prone to collapse, compared to the relatively stable volcanic basalt layers. Mining through these deep sedimentary formations would have posed significant technical challenges. Without the support provided by volcanic rock, deep shafts in sedimentary layers were much more hazardous, and the mining technology of the 19th century wasn't equipped to handle such depths through these sedimentary layers, making these formations inaccessible at the time and it's likely that the miners didn't even know that these formations existed. The Calaville Formation, being the best sorted of the three alluvial layers, is likely the richest in terms of accessible gold content. While the Renmark Group is similar to the Shepparton Formation, it's also poorly sorted. So let's take a look at the layer that was mined. The Shepparton Formation is listed as Pliocene to Holocene in age, spanning from around 5.3 million years ago to the present day. It's a significant geological deposit in the Murray-Darling Basin, primarily composed of clay, sand and gravel. This formation extends across much of northern Victoria and southeastern New South Wales, forming part of the basin's extensive alluvial plains. 
The rivers in this region have a history of shifting courses. As rivers changed their paths over time, they deposited sediments across a broad area, creating a multi-layered alluvial plain. This process helps spread the Shepparton formation over a wide area, rather than confining it to narrow channels. This fact is key to keep in mind when we look at the section of the shallower deep lead that was never found. The issue with this formation is that it's poorly sorted, which would have been an absolute nightmare for miners, because gold would have been patchy in its distribution rather than being deposited and confined to a specific part of the river like it normally is, which makes alluvial gold mining easier. If they reached a Calaville formation, they would have been rewarded with this type of sorting. But since deep lead mining was confined to the Shepparton formation, calling mining it hellish would be an understatement. The entire formation features poorly sorted lenticular gravel beds, due to rivers in this area often forming braided or multi-channel systems. Lens-shaped gravel deposits are isolated patches of gravel that were laid down by ancient rivers with thicker centres that taper off at the edges, resembling a lens. These deposits are spread out across the landscape, rather than forming a single continuous line, making it challenging for miners to follow them as they appear and quote-unquote disappear in different spots. In such systems, gold-bearing gravels were deposited in patches. Miners would have dug into what seemed like promising gold-bearing gravels, only to encounter different types of sediment that disrupted the trail. This doesn't occur in the Calaville Formation, where sediments are well sorted, but it does occur in the Renmark Formation, where these poorly sorted lenticular gravel beds occur again. The Calaville Formation was deposited by high-energy rivers during the Miocene. These rivers had strong, sustained flows, which enabled them to transport larger, coarser materials like gravel and sand over longer distances. The result is well-sorted sediments, where the grain sizes are more uniform. If you're like me, you might be asking why was the Calaville Formation well-sorted compared to the other two layers? To be brief, the answer to this question is the result of several factors. Tectonic uplift from the Great Dividing Range, which increased river gradients and flow speeds, combined with a wetter climate that provided greater runoff and discharge. The bedrock itself beneath these alluvial deposits is likely to be similar to the bedrock that exists in gold-bearing regions in Victoria, with it likely containing gold-enriched quartz reefs due to ancient tectonic processes. Okay, so now that we've discussed why mining in the Shepparton Formation is nothing short of hell, let's conclude this video with an insight into what the leads may look like and why they've never been found. Prior to earthquakes that lifted the Cadal Block near Echuca 45,000 years ago, these rivers joined with the Murray in a location known as Green Gully. The Murray has more or less always followed a similar area in its extent. Prior to Green Gully, it flowed further north. One thing to note is that even with the dramatic uplift that occurred 45,000 years ago, when a series of earthquakes uplifted the Cadal Fault by as much as 12 to 15 metres, the Campaspe could still flow north based on topographical studies. The primary factor preventing the Campaspe River from continuing to flow north beyond Echuca today is its convergence with the present course of the Murray River. So it's likely that it connected with the even more ancient iteration of the Murray that flowed north of the Niloquin, which means the area of gold saturation is even more pronounced than it was if it stopped at Green Gully. Now it's possible that Green Gully itself has some gold deposits, but they would likely be patches of fine gold that are poorly sorted. The best areas to look would be where the river that connected to it used to flow. Now trying to piece together where this would be is a monumental task, as the Murray has completely changed the landscape when it took its new course, and has buried any former channels with sediment. This is where we employ geophysical scans to help us out. Radiometric scans, particularly those that focus on potassium content, are essential in this kind of investigation. Potassium is a key marker because potassium-bearing minerals such as feldspar and mica often accumulate in alluvial sediments left behind by ancient rivers. These minerals, over time, weather down into clays like illite, which can be traced through radiometric surveys. Potassium emits gamma rays as it decays, and this radiation can be detected by airborne or ground-based radiometric surveys. Using radiometric scans, we look for anomalies or higher concentrations of potassium, which can indicate areas where ancient river systems once deposited fine sediments. Radiometric data helps us to see slightly beneath the surface without disturbing the land. However, there are some types of limitation to this type of geophysical scan. The river needs to be relatively shallow and free from basaltic rock, which is high in potassium and can interfere with readings. If you're looking for deep leads in volcanic areas, it's better to use magnetic surveys instead. However, because the Murray was disrupted in a way that drastically changed its course over a short period, the ancient rivers connected to it are relatively shallow as well. 
If I had access to seismic surveys of the area, this would be the best tool to use to find the deep leads, along with LiDAR. But I do not have access to either of these tools, so radiometric scans are the next best option. You can see that the area where the Murray flows is yellow on these scans. This is because the river is actively running and constantly moving sediments, which means less accumulation of potassium-bearing minerals compared to surrounding areas. The red areas, by contrast, indicate where potassium-rich minerals have accumulated in more stable, older sediments. In deep leads, potassium-bearing minerals, especially potassium-40 isotopes, undergo radioactive decay, emitting gamma radiation. Since deep leads are older, stable sedimentary environments, these minerals have had more time to accumulate and start decaying, increasing the intensity of gamma radiation detected in the scans. This contributes to the red colour, indicating higher levels of radioactive decay from potassium. So we can see that beyond Echuca, the Compasby used to run north and connect with the Murray at Green Gully, and it did so in a braided multi-channel system like it did in Victoria. Some parts of it have been disturbed by the recent rivers that cut through the area, but we can still piece together a rough picture. You can see that the Green Gully area is very high in potassium, as the Murray deposited these potassium-bearing minerals prior to being cut off by the earthquake and uplift that occurred in the Cadell Fault. Again, it's likely that stacked deep leads exist here, from the youngest to the oldest iteration of the Compasby, which likely flowed through Green Gully and even further northwest beyond it, when the Murray used to flow north of the Niloquin, based on topographical studies that hint to this occurrence. It's likely that the Compasby used to travel northwest and connect with the Murray at this point. So today, the area is almost all privately owned, and is used extensively for agriculture. The land is primarily utilised for crops such as grains, fruit, vegetables and livestock farming due to the availability of irrigation from rivers. In Australia, mining on agricultural land is not outright prohibited, but it is subject to strict regulations. Due to the depth, it's unlikely that these missed leads will ever be mined, unfortunately. But if they did, we have multiple levels that could be worked, and vast amounts of gold that have been deposited in the past 90 million years since the uplift of the Dividing Range occurred and the Murray River began life. But with that being said, we just don't know what occurred before this uplift. It's possible that the Compasby has been flowing through this area for hundreds of millions of years. Imagine the amount of gold that lies in wait, buried beneath sediment. Gold that was never found, and was likely never even thought to exist. So this concludes episode 1 of this series. It's been a long journey, so thank you to anyone who stayed through the entire video up to this point. It means the world to me. The next two videos will be just as in-depth as this one, so remember to subscribe if you enjoyed this, as we look into other gold-rich locations that were never discovered. And don't forget to check out our paid partner, BetterHelp, to get 10% off your first month of therapy. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.